migration, um, diversity and justice here at the Brussels School of Governance and the Free University in Brussels. Um, the way that the call will go today is that I will turn over to Sian, who is from the Principles for Responsible Management Education, and she will tell us a bit about how our working group is situated um, within PRME. And then I'll give a brief overview of our working group and sort of um, share a little bit about our, the aims of our working group. And then we'll turn it over to our guest speaker today, um, to uh, Dr. Kernigan, um, to present uh, his work um, on whether or not um, there should be an 11th peace principle um, uh, for the global compacts uh, core principles. And then we'll have a bit of time for discussion afterwards. So um, Sienna, if I could go ahead and turn it over to you, please. Yes, thank you so much, Christina, for the warm welcome. Um, so I am just going to give everyone a brief introduction to Prime. Thank you all for being here, and I'm sure you're all very excited for an insightful webinar. Just before we begin, um, we wanted to, oops, sorry, take some time and share that Prime was established in 2007 by an international task force of deans, university presidents, and different academic institutions, as well as accreditation institutions. And so um, the Principles for Responsible Management Education is a United Nations sponsored initiative, and it's also a sister initiative to the UN Global Compact, which is the largest corporate sustainability initiative in the world and serves as the face to of sustainability and United Nation um, endeavors to businesses and small, medium enterprises um, and large Fortune 500 companies. And so we are proud to say that Prime has 880 signatories currently, and we operate in 99 countries with 17 regional chapters that take the prime principles and adapt them to their regional context. And last but not least, we also have nine working groups. And the working groups allow us to achieve our mission and vision in very targeted ways. So we have um, nine different ones on different thematic areas and that are focused on different SDGs, sustainable development goals. And so the working groups operate through different initiatives, activities, webinars, such as the one we're currently in as and um, uh, different activities. And so we aim to bring educators, scholars and practitioners together so that way we can discuss and advance our our goals um, and with the greater goal of transforming responsible management education or rather management education to be more responsible. And so we would love to hear from you. Um, thank you again for being here today. And if you have any questions or ideas or thoughts or you just wanna get involved, please reach out to us. You can reach out to our Senior Manager of Global Impact, Lisa Murphy, um, for more information. And so that's just a very brief in introduction to Prime. I'll drop our website into the chat later on today, but feel free to explore. I'll pass it over back to Christina. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sian. Yeah, so as she mentioned, um, our working group is one of nine working groups and our working group was established in 2014 by two academics, um, Robert McNulty, McNulty, who was from Bentley College at the time, and John Kotsos, who is at American University of Sharjah. And the idea was to promote, um, to support research um, that looks at how businesses, how the private sector uh, through their core operations, uh, enhance the conditions that often determine whether or not instability, fragility will evolve into a durable peace, or on the flip side, actually um, contribute to social dissonance, for instance, um, even contribute to um, an uptick or outbreak of violence and armed conflict. So we are mainly focused on the academic or let's say scholarly work However, because we believe in this discussion um, so much so, and we believe that there is a need to have a more multi-dimensional approach to furthering this discussion along, we also welcome um, the engagement of practitioners, of civil society representatives, of policymakers, of international organizations, 
Um, so as you all have seen, um, what the slide that CN shared, we um, often partner with um, organizations such as the one uh, that CN shared with us was uh, had a photo of one of our webinars that we partnered with the ICRC and DCAP on um, to showcase a body of work that they had recently published at the time um, of organizing um, the webinar. Um, today's webinar um, is also another one where we're welcoming an academic, and then we will have another webinar um, next month, which will showcase um, a, um, a bureaucrat slash civil society representative um, who will present uh, her work on um, the Ukraine crisis, on the war in Ukraine, and whether or not there will be a place for women in the economy in the post-war reconstruction and recovery efforts. So you can see that although we are mainly an academic um, working group, we also um, integrate uh, other non-academic voices into the discussion. Um, and I can maybe share my screen with you very briefly just to show you um, two of our websites that we have that we could um, suggest you take a look at for um, your um, knowledge uh, building. We have an external website um, where we have an online repository of publications that um, are connected to the Business for Peace space. Um, and then you can see on our internal PRME sites, uh, we have a page where we upload um, the recordings of our previous um, webinars. So if you're unable to join a webinar, um, you're always uh, welcome to come back to this site to see um, the recordings from previous webinars or if you'd like to share the, your work. And of course, um, to share with your colleagues, if you'd like to share your work, please get in touch with us so that we can discuss whether or not um, you would be interested in um, presenting your work. So if we could go ahead and uh, turn to the discussion today, I'd like to um, briefly um, introduce uh, our guest speaker. Um, and I have to say that um, Professor Webb in, uh, invited me to give some remarks on um, the topic earlier in the year. And I was um, very inspired by all the hard work that he's put into uh, the topic. So I was delighted that he would then reciprocate the welcome uh, to our working group um, and present um, at one of our webinars. Um, Dr. Kernigan Webb is an associate professor um, in the law and business department um, at the Ted Rogers School of Management. He's also the founding director of the Institute for the Study of Corporate Social Responsibility at Toronto Metropolitan University. I think today's um, topic is an important one, uh, not only because there are uh, numerous um, armed conflicts around the world that are sort of forcing us in a way, in some sense, um, to think more um, thoughtfully on the role of businesses in enhancing those conditions that determine um, whether or not instability, as I mentioned early, earlier on, can have an influence um, over um, conflict dynamics uh, and actually contribute to durable peace or not. Um, but there is this big um, uh, war uh, happening, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, that is really pushing more people to think about this. And so I think it is a very timely topic to have um, Dr. Webb's uh, presentation. And then we look forward to having a discussion uh, afterwards. So Karen, again, if I could turn over to you, please. Absolutely. Absolutely, you can. And thank you so much, Christina, for the uh, the introduction and to Sienna for uh, organizing the overall uh, work of the PRME, which is a superb uh, sister organization to UN Global Compact. Um, I'm now going to uh, share my screen here. So just hold on a second while I get that up and running. <clears throat> Here we go. Can everybody see that? I'm going to switch it into. Uh, um, yes. Okay, I'm going to switch it into since I can find a slideshow. Here we go. Slideshow from the beginning. Kaboom. Okay. So, <clears throat> first of all, just in terms of the title of this, you'll note uh, that I'm emphasizing that. Uh, um, the exploration of the of the eleventh uh, global compact peace principle uh, has to be understood within this very fragile 
uh, and incomplete global governance ecosystem that we're a part of. And we just see around the world uh, in non-conflict uh, uh, situations, non-war situations, we just see how fragile it is when we see the uh, United States teetering on the edge of autocracy with denial of elections or Brazil or uh, also in, in Europe, similar uh, so, uh, sort of uh, fragility there. And that's just uh, in, in the kind of the, the uh, uh, some of the uh, more developed countries in developing countries, it's even more fragile. So we have a very, very fragile uh, governance ecosystem in the world. And uh, it needs to be understood that uh, everything that uh, I'm suggesting is part of this fragile evolving approach. So um, this one slide seems very dense in front of you, but the, uh, um, the advantage of this one slide is that in this one slide, basically you have my entire presentation. I will of course unpack these points um, depending on time availability, but if you have to leave early, this is the basic point here. So point number one, undoubtedly the UN is the foremost intergovernmental body for maintaining international peace and security. This having been said, from day one, the United Nations in 1945 said that the United Nations is a work in progress and it's constantly evolving. In fact, I'd go one step further to say the entire global governance ecosystem is constantly evolving and is incomplete and fragile and highly imperfect, highly, highly imperfect. <clears throat> and we're witnessing that with respect to the response uh, to uh, to the Russian aggression in uh, yeah, in, in uh, the Ukraine. Point number two, one area of considerable uh, UN evolution has been increasingly over time, uh, the UN has said, in, in addition to our intergovernmental focus point, we need to work directly with the business sector and civil society. <clears throat> and again, I'll unpack that more throughout the, the session, but this is an evolution the UN moving away from being very focused on state to state type of uh, interactions and recognizing the need to uh, uh, to go beyond that and indeed uh, that their effectiveness can be improved by going beyond that and working directly with business and civil society. And you see that especially with respect to the UN Global Compact um, uh, and now these uh, sister initiatives that have been uh, developed uh, along with that, the UNPRI, uh, Sustainable Stock Exchange, the uh, PRME that here we are a part of here today, uh, as well as the direct involvement of business in the UN SDGs. So we even see it within the UN Global Compact itself, which started with nine principles and now has 10 principles, thus uh, establishing a precedent that there's nothing magic about whatever are the current number of principles. They can be expanded if there is a need, and arguably I'm suggesting there is. So the horrific Russian continued aggression in uh, Ukraine is stress testing the limits of what intergovernmental bodies can do, what governments can do, what business can do, what civil society can do. It is in fact the catalyst for this presentation, but that having been said, there have been, uh, and there unfortunately will continue to be uh, other aggressions. And so uh, I'm just using this as the point of departure for uh, a suggestion of an 11th principle that should be relevant on a going forward basis beyond the immediate horrific Russian invasion of the Ukraine. So as I say here, every crisis is an opportunity for, for new thinking. So um, there's currently no UN Global Compact peace principle, although there is excellent work, uh, um, which is called the Business for Peace Initiative within the UN Global Compact. So uh, I'm suggesting that a strong argument could be made uh, that there should be a, a peace principle, given the centrality of peace to the entire UN uh, uh, initiative as, as a whole, where peace has been from day one, the central primordial uh, uh, concern of uh, the UN. And yet, strangely, it's missing as a primordial principle of the UN Global Compact. Um, and um, uh, not having it as a peace principle, having it uh, as just subsumed within the other 10 principles, it uh, kind of sends a signal. Someone can just uh, mute there. Sends a signal uh. 
Yeah, someone could. Why is this up? Jernigan, now you're on mute. Yeah. 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 Okay. In order to mute someone else, uh, I got muted as well. See, that's the problem with uh, these bigger initiatives. They sometimes have uh, collateral uh, uh, impacts which are not intended. Anyway, uh, I make the metaphor or the analogy with health. Uh, health for humans is something that requires ongoing attention. Um, it veers into the very problematic when it's discovered that somebody has got a disease or they're injured in some way. But um, health is like peace. It is a primordial condition that allows everything else to blossom, human rights, respect for rule of law, and so on. So um, uh, I'm suggesting that uh, we need to have peace as a, a good argument can be made that peace should be a, a primordial recognized principle on its own and not subsumed uh, within other uh, uh, work of the of the 10 uh, principles. So um, at the bottom here, I'm saying that a, uh, uh, a formal structured process for consideration as to whether or not there should be a UN Global Compact Peace Principle should be put in place with perhaps this talk and associated publications being a point of departure for uh, the development of such a UN Global Compact 11th principle. So that is in a nutshell, uh, what I'll be now unpacking in, in greater detail in uh, the uh, subsequent uh, part of the presentation. So if I can somehow or other get this to uh, go on to the next slide and can't seem to do that. It's frozen. So just hold on a second while I try to unfreeze things here. I'm going to have to stop sharing for a second. And uh, back to here. Start sharing again. Let's see if this works. No, it doesn't. So um, hold on a second one more time. And, uh, and I will one more time try to share here. So please excuse the fact that I have now taken it out of the um, uh, slideshow uh, format because that's where I seem to lose functionality in terms of uh, um, uh, going from slide to slide. So um, I'll talk a little bit about the genesis for this work specifically, and then work our way through the other points that are listed here. So. Um, the genesis of this work is uh, that I used to be a special advisor to the UN Global Compact um, with respect to the development of the ISO 26000 Social Responsibility Standard. I am no longer a special advisor to the UN Global Compact. Everything that I'm doing now is entirely my own and should not in any way be considered to be a, a kind of a reflection of where the UN Global Compact itself is. So this is just me speaking. Uh, but uh, as uh, part of the work that I do for the CSR Institute here at uh, Toronto Metropolitan University, I ended up having a discussion with the former UN Global Compact Executive Director, York Kell, uh, and uh, so we had a, a CSR Institute session available to everybody in the world where we were discussing the uh, Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine and the business response to it. And it occurred to me in the middle of that uh, uh, discussion with Jörg Kell that uh, perhaps it was time for a, uh, an 11th principle, and I suggested it during that session. Again, this is not something that Jörg suggested, and I want to make it absolutely clear that Jörg is not uh, taking any position whatsoever with respect to the UN Global Compact 11th peace principle idea. This is mine, but that was the genesis of this particular work was uh, an earlier discussion that I had with Jörg Kell. Um, 
So uh, yeah, I want to also emphasize that um, uh, the, uh, the UN itself and individual countries and businesses are doing terrific work right now to counter uh, Russia. Uh, and um, I, I want to absolutely um, acknowledge that I, I, everything that I'm doing and saying, uh, I understand this is a very delicate uh, uh, situation right now. And um, I am a scholar at a university, and I'm just bringing up this idea here, but I'm highly respectful of the existing great work being done by uh, the UN and uh, individual governments and businesses and civil society organizations around the world. Um, so this is the provocation for this presentation based on the premise that how this situation is handled will have significant bearing on possible future peace uh, threatening uh, situations arising. And I will just correct this typo right here before I go any further. Okay, um, so this work also fits within work that I've done, which is this concept of sustainable governance. Sustainable governance starts from the proposition that uh, in order to address the challenging situations that we have in the 21st century, environmental, social, and economic, uh, the best opportunity that we have for uh, successfully addressing them, whether it's climate change, war, uh, uh, human rights issues, and so on, is through a mix of uh, instruments, institutions, processes, and actors from all three of government, the private sector, and civil society. Um, and uh, sometimes that means a great deal of collaboration. Sometimes it involves a certain amount of friction. The friction is not necessarily a bad thing because the friction helps to identify where there are problems. There's checking and balancing going on between various different uh, initiatives and instruments and so on. And that's not necessarily a bad thing at all. I'm going to try again to get to the next slide, see if I'm able to do that. Yes, I am. Fantastic. So um, the UN Global Compact uh, has to be understood within the UN itself. The UN Charter, which is a um, treaty, um, is the founding document for the UN, uh, the UN itself, uh, has more than 45 references to peace, uh, which is uh, indicative of the fact that fundamentally, the United Nations is a peace-oriented intergovernmental entity. So within that, the UN Global Compact is an initiative of the UN Secretary General. Um, it has 10 principles pertaining to human rights, labor, environment, and anti-corruption, albeit it started with only nine. Um, within that uh, overall UN Global Compact, uh, incredible amount of good, great work, there is uh, the business for peace part of it, but the business for peace part of it is, doesn't have a principle affiliated with it. It basically draws on and contributes to all of the existing principles. And there is a strong interaction between all of the existing principles and peace. And uh, that's not problematic. Uh, there would continue to be a strong interaction as there already is among the existing 10 principles in order for each of those principles to be effective. They interact with the others and complement and, and reinforce and so on. Uh, so the UN Global Compact also has developed a number of fantastic sister initiatives, such as the uh, Principles for Responsible Investment uh, and the Sustainable Stock Exchange, uh, UN and uh, uh, the UN uh, Principles for Responsible Management Education. So um, beyond the UN Global Compact, you see terrific work going on in the UN, such as the Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights and the um, Sustainable Development Goals, and both of those are examples of initiatives where uh, the business role has been singled out uh, for particular attention. So uh, showing this evolution of the UN moving from being intergovernmental to being intergovernmental and now recognizing to be effective, it needs to work with non-state entities of one sort or another. Within the UN SDGs, we see that peace has a explicit express uh, um, home, uh, and that's with UN SDG 16, unlike the Global Compact, where it doesn't have, in the list of 10, it doesn't have uh, a explicit, explicit, explicit home. There's also terrific work going on outside of the UN as part of this 
global architecture pertaining to the role of business, such as the OECD multinational enterprise guidelines, the voluntary principles on security and human rights, ISO 26000, uh, the GRI, EITI, which is Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. I'm mentioning those because those are all non-state, the voluntary principles on security and human rights, the ISO 26000, uh, the Global Reporting Initiative, and EITI. They're, they are hybrid or non-state initiatives. They're not UN initiatives. And then the EU is doing terrific work in this area as well. Um, and uh, individual governments are doing terrific work um, with respect to ESG and due diligence for businesses and so on. So unpacking the idea of a UN Global Compact Peace Principle. What I've done here is I've developed a methodology uh, to understand how it is we could construct a, a principle um, specifically for peace, for the UN Global Compact. I took a look at the existing 10 principles and uh, what I did was I analyzed where do those existing 10 principles come from? What is the sentence structure of the existing 10 principles? How are those principles framed within that sentencing structure? And then what is their transpositional authority? I'll explain each of those. So the um, uh, each of the 10 principles is derived from an existing UN uh, intergovernmental instrument of one sort or another. And so uh, in this case, the, uh, the peace principle would be derived from the UN Charter, which is an international, inter, uh, international treaty, uh, also from international human, humanitarian law uh, uh, treaties. So that's uh, similar to the fact that the other 10 principles all are based in there being an existing UN treaty or other um, authoritative instrument directed at governments, directed at governments. In terms of the sentence structure, all 10 of the UN Global Compact Principles start off with this business should declaratory form. So arguably, so should the peace one, the peace principle, uh, should it be developed. In terms of framing it, when I took a look at the 10 principles, the two that seem to be most similar in terms of uh, the concepts and in terms of uh, the, the way that they're constructed are those pertaining to human rights and uh, anti-corruption. And uh, you'll see them below, I've listed them below. And I emulate them uh, in my uh, draft version of what the principle could look like. And then in terms of transpositional authority, what I'm referring to is that essentially the UN Global Compact transposes intergovernmental instruments that are directed at states, it transposes it into uh, uh, instruments that are directed at businesses. So that's that's what uh, this new principle does as well. So you see uh, UN Global Compact Human Rights Principle 1 and 2 uh, says businesses should support and respect protection of internationally proclaimed human rights and make sure they are not complicit in human rights abuses. That's human rights principles, or that's uh, UN Global Compact Human Rights Principles 1 and 2. And the UN Global Compact Anti-Corruption Principle says businesses should work against corruption in all its forms, including ext extortion and bribery. So I took the construction of those two based upon this methodology, and here is a draft of what a UN Global Compact 11th Principle pertaining to peace could look like. The highlighted words means this is where I'm drawing on the construction uh, of the earliers as a kind of a, a model to follow. So business should work to maintain and build. That's similar to should support, right? Uh, uh, and work against. So uh, business should work against is uh, principle 10. So work against conflict in all its forms, including international armed conflict and non airs and assist as far as possible in humanitarian aid. So uh, it talks about in all its forms, including uh, and make sure. So it's kind of following the same construction. None of us should get too excited one way or the other about the fact uh, of this possible construction of it, because this is just me. This is just me talking. And I've just provided it so that people can understand this is what it could look like and how it would fit with the others. So in terms of the business contribution to peace, we see uh, the uh, um, UN Secretary General uh, appointed uh, Assistant Secretary General, uh, originally responsible for the UN Global Compact, uh, Sanda Oyam uh, Oyambo, uh, saying the following things here. And I'm just going to point out that she's basically saying how business uh, has got a critical role to play with respect to peace. 
And then this is the Ukraine UN Global Compact Local Network. And they're saying every international business operating in business contributes to sponsoring resources, every ruble paid and so on. So this is uh, the UN Global Compact Local Network making a point that uh, businesses should find some way uh, of exiting uh, uh, Russia um, as far as possible. Now, scholarly understandings of this, I, I, I'm drawing on um, a contribution that Christina made at a talk that she made with me on the UN Global Compact uh, 11th principle done pursuant to our university's institute for uh, uh, corporate social responsibility. So Christina, um, um, if I have said anything wrong here, you can correct me momentarily. But she pointed out that there's a peace paradigm. A peace paradigm start with the proposition that there's direct violence and there's indirect violence and that the absence of personal violence is negative peace and the absence of structural violence is positive peace. The two together lead to peace. What I'm pointing out is what appears to be non-emphasized is there's no identification of the role of business in this peace paradigm. And I'm suggesting that's what needs to be added from a scholarly standpoint uh, with respect to security paradigms. Um, traditional security is state-based and analyzed in terms of who are the objects of state security and human security is individual-based. Arguably, a missing dimension, again, is the role of business and civil society. What roles do they play in state and individual security, positively and negatively, and how are they impacted? A suggestion for a process going forward, should this idea get traction, that there could be an 11th principle. Uh, the UN Global Compact, perhaps drawing on the work of the Business for Peace, should convene a small multi-stakeholder task force to articulate the key questions, process, objectives that would underlie the introduction of a UN Global Compact 11th principle, peace principle. Then research that would be UNGC sponsored. I'm not saying it would be paid for by the UNGC, but it would be done under the auspices of the UN Global Compact that would uh, essentially follow up on this point one here. Uh, and it could also include things like uh, 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 conducting a survey uh, of uh, UN Global Compact members and so on. On that basis, hold a UN Global Compact conference specifically on should there be a UN Global Compact 11th principle? And uh, drawing on all of that, then have a UN Global Compact multi-stakeholder consensus normative deliberative uh, process on should there be a UN Global Compact 11th principle? And the thing that occurred to me when I went through all of this is that currently the UN Global Compact does not have a deliberative process in place for considering any new principles. And uh, the, the 10th principle on anti-corruption was added uh, about five years after the UN Global Compact came into place, but there was no particular process for uh, introducing that. It was, just, it was just introduced. And I'm suggesting why, why not create a structured approach, not just for possible consideration of a peace principle, but more broadly for any other ideas for new principles that could be added to the UN Global Compact in the future based upon this work. So that is it, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the conclusions is a repeat of the opening summary slide, so I'm therefore not going to repeat it here, but I will emphasize this final point. I am not suggesting that there should be an 11th Global Compact principle. Uh, I'm suggesting that there should be a process for considering whether or not there should be an 11th Global Compact principle. I understand that this is tricky territory, uh, but just because it's tricky, I don't think is a, uh, a reason not to fully explore it. So I wanted to give time for comments. I can certainly unpack and uh, uh, explain or discuss any of these points in more detail, but I wanted to give a brief uh, discussion now because I wanted to benefit from uh, uh, the audience's uh, um, uh, ideas and suggestions. And that's where I will stop. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Karen. Again, that's quite a lot to unpack, exactly. I wonder um, whether or not you're aware of or have been in communication with other um, private sector oriented initiatives. I'm particularly um, thinking of the ICC in Paris. I know that this year they launched a fund for peace is what they're calling it um, as a way to encourage um, at least their members um, to focus more on how 
their operations might have an impact on peace. I understand that they're also um, kind of in this process of uh, discovering what they actually mean by peace. Is it just an absence of violence, you know, direct or uh, violence, or is it also an abs about an absence of indirect violence and the two together is, is actually what we're talking about. And then if anybody else would like to jump in, you know, if you have questions, please feel free, or if you have ideas or you're aware of any other activities or, or initiatives, please uh, feel free to, to, to step in. Well, first of all, thanks, Christina. Um, with respect to the work of the International Chamber of Commerce, uh, it is uh, absolutely to be applauded. The, the key thing to point out, though, is that that work is work which is done by businesses not under the umbrella of the UN, um, and it is um, uh, what I would consider to be part of, if you're going to have any sustainable uh, governance approach, whether it's at the global level or um, more locally in any particular area, you need to have that combination of instruments, institutions, and processes, because that's what makes it robust. Um, if, it, if there's just a single flower, um, if that single flower, for whatever reason, uh, either because of absence of water or too much sun or uh, inadequate minerals in the soil or whatever it might be, if there's only a single flower, um, it's very vulnerable to being flattened or crushed uh, or inhibited. But if you have a field of flowers, uh, then even if one, for whatever reason, falls uh, down, the others are there. So I would view the work of the Chamber of Commerce to be highly laudable, but what it's missing is this structure that would come from it being a UN Global Compact principle. Uh, and then you have this let all flowers bloom. The others can work within that because the UN Global Compact is best positioned uh, given its multi-stakeholder nature and given the, le the legitimacy of the UN uh, to, to provide that framework and that structure that then can be uh, drawn on and supported and developed uh, by work by, for example, the International Chamber of Commerce, or there's excellent work going on in the Ukraine. They have their own special um, business for peace uh, work. It's not it's not B for P as in UN Global Compact, but it's excellent work that's going on there, highlighting where businesses are doing things wrong and where things are where they're doing right. That again, it it just it's done right now in an ad hoc independent way. And I'm suggesting um, if, if there was an 11th principle of the UN Global Compact that could frame the overarching principle, definitions and so on, which are currently missing and are allowing uh, you know, work to carry on that's not necessarily aligned the way it could be. And uh, without that alignment, it could be less effective than it could be. Thank you for that. Would, would anybody else like to jump in? Do you have any other comments, questions? Karai, maybe, do you have any questions? I know that you had mentioned earlier on this is a relatively new space that you're exploring. Yeah, I mean, uh, for years, you know, I have taught humanitarian logistics, disaster relief, and my mission was to educate future business leaders with awareness of, you know, businesses can play a role in disaster relief in the humanitarian domain. So businesses can be a force for good. Businesses can play a role in the peace domain. This is a new thing for me. I have a lot to learn. So this is the very first step. Uh, applying, you know, this uh, Professor Kernigan's uh, 11th uh, principle to the conflict in uh, Ukraine at the moment, I mean, uh, like half of the world does not see this conflict as I see it. Mm -hmm. You know, I stand with Ukraine, it's an invasion, but I know I have contacts in China, uh, yeah. a few in Russia, in India, and in much of the developing world, you know, they see this as, you know, uh, a conflict and maybe the path towards peace uh, also relates to not supporting Ukraine with weapons. I mean, uh, my question, Professor, is how to objectively define peace? I mean, looking at the problem from the US, yes, supporting Ukraine to take back their territories is a path towards peace. But on the other side of the world, you know, maybe not giving Ukraine any more weapons. 
and then pushing them to negotiate maybe a better path towards peace. Like the other 10 principles, I, I think they can be defined more objectively, like human rights, labor, right? Environment, there could be common ground in a polarized world. But when it comes to peace, uh, I, 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 it, it's not clear in my mind how this could be both uh, in the developing world more, more specifically. Right, uh, great points. Um, well, this is exactly why I'm suggesting there needs to be a UN Global Compact peace principle in order to deal with, first of all, the definitional issues. So the UN um, and treaties do make very clear what constitutes lack of peace. And that means, for example, when one state moves into the territory of the other state and uses violence to do so. That, that's a objective definition of one form of non-peace. It's when one state moves into another state and applies violence against that other state. That's an objective uh, uh, definition, which could be incorporated into the uh, the way it is with the existing 10 principles is underneath the 10 principles, then there's an elaboration of things. So that's exactly the sort of thing that could be addressed. Now, uh, your point that some countries in the world are actually not supportive of uh, the Ukraine. Uh, they are, are actually supportive of Russia on this. Well, see, that points to the limitations of relying on the states and intergovernmental approaches to address things because they are imperfect. States themselves are imperfect. The intergovernmental processes are imperfect. There is the capability of businesses to operate um, and they are not the state. And so, for example, they can do things because they are not the state. Therefore, they are not uh, uh, directly implicated by state actions. Uh, they are capable of doing things that the state cannot do. And uh, I'm not suggesting in any way that uh, businesses are a replacement for the state. They are a, a uh, distinctive force in society, a, a very powerful, distinctive force in society. And they also do not operate in a homogenous way, um, but they are capable of doing things that uh, uh, governments cannot do. And they are capable of doing things in support of what government is doing. And they are capable of countering uh, aggressions through their own ways. I mean, if we take a look at South Africa and the uh, movement from apartheid to non-apartheid, the role of business in divesting, in standing up and saying this is not appropriate, was a critical role. So, uh, and I don't want to, uh, you know, go down any particular rabbit hole of any particular circumstance. I'm simply trying to point out here that there is a distinctive capability that businesses have, and it is it is deserving of distinctive attention, just as it is within the UN as a whole, where peace is a distinctive key objective of the UN. So why would it not be a key objective of the UN Global Compact, which is the subset of the UN that is directed specifically at business? That's my point. Okay, makes sense, thank you. Um, Christina, uh, if others um, are, are still formulating their ideas for questions, which incidentally they can put in a ch in chat if they don't want to say anything uh, by audio, um, I'm very interested to hear your thoughts with respect to uh, the uh, uh, the scholarly uh, the scholarly part and my paradigms. Where uh, can can I uh, flash that back up on the screen? So I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that. So Christina participated in a, a, a Toronto Metropolitan University institute session on exploring this very issue uh, and um, she specifically brought up the various scholarly paradigms that are relevant here and um, I took those I, I tried to accurately and faithfully um, transcribe uh, what she said but then I pointed out to where I think there's area for considerable innovation from us as uh, as scholars here so I'm just going to put that up uh, on the screen here so that everybody can see what I'm talking about. 
Sure, maybe I'll just say a few comments about um, our working group. So as uh, Cien um, uh, graciously shared with us, PRME is an um, initiative that mainly focuses on business and management schools um, and business and management um, education. Um, however, considering that the business for peace space um, also leans heavily on political science and IR uh, theories, such as the peace um, theory, um, we do we find ourselves oftentimes in this sort of awareness building um, position. Um, and so I think it is very helpful to yeah, set the scene, so to speak, um, or so to say, um, with regards to what are we trying to measure um, so that we're also all on the same page. And that's why um, when I participated in Kernigan's um, webinar a few months ago, I, I just presented the different peace paradigms um, and our working group members, I think it's also interesting to note is that um, we're not all business and management academics. Um, so I am actually a poli sci and IR academic, um, maybe I'm in disguise, um, so to speak, but then um, we also promote, um, let's say, interdisciplinary um, collaboration. Um, we've written some blog pieces um, for PRME about kind of trying to encourage business and management schools to reach out to their uh, sister departments in poli sci and IR and vice versa. Um, poli sci and IR um, departments um, could equally do the same and reach out to their business and, and, and management um, colleagues. American University has a new um, degree program, which actually allows um, poli sci IR students, business and management students to take um, joint courses. So they actually are trying to, to kind of cross fertilize some of these concepts. Um, and yeah, I, maybe I don't necessarily need to talk a little, talk more about the slide here, but it's, um, I think important to understand that we as a working group are trying to, we come at um, the idea of peace from a multi-dimensional perspective. So of course we are concerned about this absence of, of direct violence um, however, we're also interested in the absence of indirect uh, violence. So we're talking about you know, structural violence, such as poverty and inequality and so forth. And so we really have this impression or this perspective where peace is actually the kind of yeah, umbrella, let's say, um, of these different peace paradigms. And I think if you, if you then translate into that perspective into how a business operates, a business through their core operations, how they hire people, um, how they interact with the government, how they interact with communities and their impact on the environment and so forth, it becomes a bit clearer. So it's much more than just their social investments, much more than their you know, CSR activities. It's really about their core operations, who are they as, as, a, as an entity and how they relate to society or their position in society. Absolutely correct. And, you know, I should point out, I'm a law professor, you know, that that's, <laughs> that's my angle here. But, um, you know, really, really, when we look at just using the uh, um, uh, Russian invasion of, of Ukraine, as uh, as a kind of a test case for this, um, there is, uh, on the one hand, there's what can businesses do with respect to humanitarian relief in the Ukraine. And, uh, you know, that, that is an area where there's an incredible amount of uh, good that businesses can do uh, or harm that businesses can do, um, uh, but there's tr a tremendous amount that businesses can do there. But then there's the aggressor state. What can uh, businesses do with respect to the aggressor state? And so you see different responses from uh, different uh, uh, multinational businesses in that regard. Uh, do they pause? Do they, uh, do, uh, is, is there something that the businesses operating in that are non-Russian businesses operating in Russia, are they doing? You see that the uh, UN Global Compact Ukraine um, uh, local network says, any taxes, any taxes paid by these businesses to uh, the Russian government, that constitutes a contribution to the aggression. I'm not saying that's right. I'm pointing that out to say what it, it's not just about how businesses can assist with the humanitarian side, you know, with the victim state where there's tremendous amounts that can be done, is being done, should be done. Uh, that's that's all very good. But what about with the aggressor? What can businesses do there? And I'm not suggesting it's as simple 
Uh, it's a simple answer. I, I would imagine that it would depend very much on the individual business and it would depend very much on the sector that the business is in and uh, exactly what they're currently doing in the aggressor country, but they have a capability just like is true with respect to human rights and is true with respect to uh, environment and, and labor. They have a capability. And I'm suggesting the more that we can structure that, it will allow for a greater likelihood of collective action by business. Uh, and it's as collective action that perhaps businesses can be most forceful as opposed to just individuated ad hoc and uh, arguably having an appropriate conceptual and practical structure to explain and understand those various different possible roles and the principles underneath them uh, would be arguably of uh, great assistance to businesses who are kind of uh, saying now what do we do what, you know what what do we do in this circumstance we don't have a guide uh, and a set of principles and a structure that's going to assist us in understanding exactly what it is we should do and so that's kind of where I'm coming from and as you see here on these highlighted points here, um, uh, what is the role of business? How are businesses impacted by both uh, these types of violence? And how can businesses contribute to the reduction of these? And similarly, uh, what's the role of business? What roles do they play in state and individual security, positively and negatively? And how are they impacted? I would just like to just, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Do you, do you go ahead. <laughs> Oh, I was just going to say, I completely agree with that last point. Um, I think we have to remember that um, it's not necessarily just completely up to the businesses, like their, their um, customers, employees, their constituents, they are demanding for action. And so they have to be responsive. You know, they are being responsive because they're being held accountable by a completely different group. And so I think that having this guidance in place and having more proactive discussions, having a principle where they can receive that guidance, as well as have an opportunity to provide feedback if they don't agree with something, um, you know, and helping to shape and form those norms is important. So I, I actually completely support having a principle. My question is, is procedurally, is there not a current way to adopt a new principle or what does that process look like? You know, this is, this is the interesting thing. Thanks, June, uh, appreciate that. Um, the, uh, the original nine principles were developed uh, by the UN Secretary General uh, in consultation with um, a few very key advisors uh, and they, they came up they came up with the original nine principles, and then that was introduced and uh, various different companies around the world said, great idea, we support, we're going to join and all that sort of stuff. Um, but uh, then the 10th principle uh, pertaining to anti-corruption was added, and um, there was no particular process for that. And that's why I'm saying, you know, uh, quite apart from specifically, should there be an 11th global compact principle pertaining to peace, um, I, I, I'll just bring it up here. I'm suggesting that there's room for development of a structured approach to considering any new UN Global Compact principle as need arises. So uh, if I can just go back up to that here for a second. So I'm suggesting that this could be a process, start with a small multi-stakeholder task force to outline what are the questions, the sorts of questions that we've discussed here today that need answers, what sort of process do we need to go from here, what are the objectives, then do research, so this would involve PRME people and others uh, doing research around the world to develop a better understanding of the issue, then hold a conference to discuss those findings, and then on that basis, have a UN Global Compact multi-stakeholder consensus normative deliberation process for the development or non-development of the principle. Uh, air it out fully. This is this is what other uh, parts of uh, uh, the international architecture do. For example, ISO develops an ISO 26000 standard. They bring together 
uh, experts from around the world, and they have to be from government, private sector, and civil society. Uh, the drafts of those standards are put out for comment, and then on that basis, uh, the comments are considered, and on that basis, a final uh, version of whatever standard they propose is developed. I'm saying, why, why shouldn't there be a similar process for, for something like this? We have about three minutes before our call is due to end. Maybe, I don't know, Diana, if you want to jump in here, she made a comment in the chat about how we need more perspective from business scholars. And that's actually the impetus to why our working group was founded. Robert McNulty from Bentley College, who I mentioned, he founded our working group and he is a premier scholar in the business ethics field. And he felt um, exactly the same way that you, uh, at least you demonstrated in your chat feel. Um, and, you know, we are very fortunate to be a working group of PRME, um, which means, you know, we have great access to business and management schools that are signatories. Um, however, you know, it, it's, it's at the end of the day, it's up to the business and, and management academic themselves, whether or not they want to pick up the business for peace field um, or integrate it into their curriculum. Um, and I can tell you, you know, from personal experience here at the Free University of Brussels, I reached out to my business and management colleagues um, in the business and management department um, and didn't, um, you know, get a really, uh, didn't get any interest, um, I have to say. I regularly share our webinars with them, um, the uh, social media um, or the media relations, public relations office are really supportive in that they um, promote our webinars um, um, within the VUB community. So we get visibility, but yeah, at the end of the day, it's up to the you know, respective academic themselves, whether or not they wanna um, you know, open the door to exploring the business for peace field. Um, but yeah, please keep in mind that that's, that was the impetus for why our working group was founded um, was for that very reason. Um, I suppose maybe, yeah, we're at the top of the hour. I should say thank you, um, uh, Karen, again, for, for presenting. Thank you so much for um, all of the thought that you have put into, um, you know, whether or not there should be an 11th piece principle. Um, I think it's very important for us to keep abreast of your activities and, and whether or not um, there's any momentum that builds um, around having that sort of discussion. We're very much supportive of, of that effort. So please, yeah, please keep us in mind. Um, and as Cian kindly um, included in the chat, our next um, webinar will be on December 1st. Um, she shared the topic here, Ukrainian political and economic landscape in the future. Is there a place for women with a question mark? Um, I highly um, recommend you join us. And it's, it, it nicely piggybacks on the discussion that we've had today. Um, again, if you have any questions or suggestions for future webinars, please reach out to us. Um, we're very happy to um, promote them in the future. I hope you have a great rest of the week. Thanks, Christina, Take for care. inviting me. And thanks, everybody, for, for attending. Best of luck in, of, with your work. Thank you. Likewise. Bye Take now. care.